From Union Square, in the heart of San Francisco, it's theCUBE, covering Spark Summit 2016. Brought to you by Databricks and IBM. Now, here are your hosts, John Walls and George Gilbert. And welcome back to Spark Summit 2016. I'm John Walls, along with George Gilbert, who is a senior analyst at Wikibon and right here on theCUBE. We continue our coverage here in San Francisco. We're at the, uh, on the expo floor, kind of the back tucked away of a jam-packed expo floor, I might add, too. Several sponsors, several dozen sponsors here. Everybody uh, really igniting, if you will, this excitement and enthusiasm throughout the entire Spark community. We're joined right now by Ram Shraharsha, who's a product manager of Databricks. And Ram, thanks for being with us here. Oh, it's great to be here. A lot um, of energy, right? Oh, I mean, it's fantastic. Uh, this, this, I mean, the, the way the expo has grown over the years is, is, is amazing. Spark Summit today has sold out, and we have you know, 2,500 people, right? It's, it's marvelous to yep. see the energy. And uh, compared to last time when I came here, I don't have room here at all to even walk around, and that's awesome to see. That's so you realize there, there's a lot of excuse me going on through here on this floor, which is a great sign, obviously. Yeah. Jam-packed aisles and, and some really wonderful exhibits and, yeah. and uh, throughout the pavilion. Yeah. Let's talk about, if you will, uh, during the keynotes this morning, there was uh, some discussion about uh, Apache Spark 2.0, yes. the new release coming out here in just a couple of weeks, yes. uh, compatible with 1.x, 2,000 patches, yeah. many contributors, almost 300 contributors. Yeah. Um, Talk about that in terms of just the, the kind of the scope and the scale of work that it encompasses and what you think the upgrade is yeah. from the existing system. Oh yeah, so uh, like Matei mentioned in the keynote, uh, this work has been ongoing you know, since about 1.0. So the, all around the 1.0 series, we've been thinking about what do we need to do to kind of make Spark way faster than it already is. That was one theme. The other theme was, uh, you know, how do we make streaming simpler to reason about? Mm -hmm. So if I want to take like two big takeaways from 2.0, even though there's a lot of things that we've done here, one is going to be around whole stage code generation and performance improvements that we've done there, mm -hmm. uh, which really bring, bring capabilities of massively parallel databases to Spark in a way it has not happened before, right? Uh, so you can, you know, we talked about speed ups of orders of magnitude, uh, from even 1.6. Mm. So that's that's a big takeaway for me, the fact that we can do such massive speed ups mm. and change fundamentally how the engine optimizes uh, between 1.6 to 2.0. It's a, it's a great testament to the community that we're able to do this. Mm. Uh, and uh, the other takeaway is also the fact that uh, streaming is much, much more simplified in the way we are thinking about it today. Mm. With structured streaming AP APIs, we basically, you know, you don't have to think about streaming as a separate set of applications that you have to build, right? Uh, if you understand batch processing, and if you understand SQL, you understand streaming. And that, that was a lot of emphasis on our side, which is uh, we don't want people to have two completely different systems and deal with two completely different uh, you know, sets of things to be able to incorporate streaming into their applications, right? And we also think that um, stream processing is just one aspect of the entire workflow. And what, what we want people to think about is continuous applications, right? And how do we enable you to build the continuous applications in as simple a way as possible, while still having them robust, fault tolerant, and scalable, right? Yeah, was simplicity that the driving factor yeah. there? I mean, because I, I hear that a lot, you know, yes. simple, faster, easier, yeah. but simplicity seems to be just this recurring or, or constant thread yeah. through the Spark ecosystem. Yeah, I think simplicity is one of the big reasons why uh, Spark has been hugely successful, right? Uh, you know, ultimately we want people to develop uh, successful applications on top of Spark. And if, if simplicity is not our criterion, it's going to be very hard for you to develop applications on top of Spark, right? Uh, also, we want developers to have a very good experience with Spark itself. Uh, so simplicity, not just in the Scala APIs, but also in the way it integrates with Python, R, all of this is very important for us, right? Uh, also, the simplicity of the platform itself is allows platformization more easily. That's the way we think about it, right? So I can build, for example, uh, graph applications on top of Spark while using the same code engine, as long as I keep the abstraction simple, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I can also build uh, you know, uh, SQL libraries, I can build uh, my own applications on top of this framework mm -hmm. in a much simpler fashion, uh, as long as we keep the API simple, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think see, simplicity is a very core con you know, consideration for us. Uh, but I also don't want to undersell performance because it's not enough to be simple. Simple, right? Right. right you have to right, perform. Right. 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 Yeah. So, 
Would it be fair to say that there's a, a downward facing um, amount of work which was the execution engine called yes. Tungsten yeah. to take advantage of all the new hardware coming yes. in the next five years. Yeah. And then the upward facing sort of a continuation of, for, for people who are familiar with applications that have a user interface, you have a uniform user interface but for a programmer, but now you're adding a new dimension of integration which is that everything can work anywhere from near real time to batch. Yeah. And so tell us when we put all those ingredients together, the continuous applications, let's talk about an app, a very popular one. Sure. Fraud. Okay. How does that change if you implemented it on you know, what's primarily a batch platform like Hadoop, no. and now that you've got something where you have these, this continuous um, spectrum? I see. So that's actually a very good question. So uh, instead of being very platform specific, maybe I'll start by talking about how you would typically develop a fraud application, right? Uh, so there is a few components to fraud. One thing is just figuring out what does it mean to be fraud? Right? What, what is the what what signal in your data? What is the activity that determines fraud? And that's usually very heavily algorithmic, right? Uh, people can use rules. People can use machine learning. Sometimes it's a combination of both. Uh, a lot of times it is looking at your data and figuring out which algorithm works best. Now, oftentimes this is a, the persona that does this is a data scientist. They get access to your data. But by the way, fraud data is very secure. So you cannot just open up that access to anybody. So even having secure access to that data is important when you let an analyst look at this data to figure out what algorithm to use and how to detect fraud as a signal, right? And this is very much like a batch offline ad hoc analysis scenario, right? And we are, people used to do this on top of uh, you know, databases like Teradata earlier. Uh, once Hadoop came in, people started doing this on top of Hadoop. Today people do this with Spark, right? Uh, so the persona that I'm talking about here is a data scientist who has to figure out what, how to even model fraud. But once you have done this, now I have to deploy this in production, right? I have, I have this model that I have trained, and I have to score it on every application that comes in, right? And that, again, could be either done in batch. Historically, it was done in batch, because from the time you submitted a credit card application to the time when uh, uh, the bank would hand you a credit card would be like two working weeks, right? So there was enough time to figure out that this application was fraud or not fraud. And that meant I could have batch processes that munched on this data, did the best analysis that they could, and take all the time that they could to give you a good result, right? Uh, today, the constraints are very different. So banks want to move faster, right? So I want, to, I want to prevent fraud as it's happening. So when somebody sends me a fraudulent application, I don't want to wait around for two weeks. I don't want to have editors look at these applications, curate them for whether they could be fraud or not and I want to de detect this real time. When you do this, that's when real time, uh, fairly advanced analytics comes into play, right? And if you think about doing this in a platform like Spark, the way you would do this is again, after your ad hoc analysis is done, and you understand that these are the models you want to use, now all you have to do is to use something like structured streaming, hook in your raw data, right? So that the application data that you're getting, the labels that you have in the past that said that these type of applications are fraud, now you hook it into a source, right? And that source can now seamlessly call out to your models, score on the models, and similarly, there can be a pipeline that actually continuously trains on these models as well. Even though that's a little bit more advanced today, people are not really continuously training models as fast as they can. So but what you're saying, if I can yeah. recap, yeah. you're training continuously yeah. because new patterns are emerging. New patterns emerge all and the time. And that's the core of the continuous process. Yeah, so there's two aspects to it. One is continuous training that's enabled by now the fact that we can hook up models to continuously learn from data and detect new patterns. There's also continuous scoring, which is you want to take the latest model and apply it to the latest data as fast as possible. And even okay. that you could think of doing it continuously, right? Okay. Before we let you go, I want to just have you touch on deep learning. Uh, yep. We heard a lot about that at the keynote this morning. Yes. Um, and really these these vast capabilities that are being developed with the deployment of neural networks that, yes. that run very deep, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, in terms of the big picture with, with deep learning and, yeah. and what you're thinking, the capabilities are with Spark, yeah. what do you see there as being the, the potential? 
Oh yeah, I think deep learning has been, uh, you know, rightly so, gaining a lot of attention in the machine learning community. And we recognized this at Databricks even a couple of years back. So uh, we put together this package called TensorFlow on Spark, uh, which we are calling TensorFrames. Uh, that allows you to basically run Google's TensorFlow on Spark clusters, mm -hmm. right? And we are also, uh, uh, there was a meetup just yesterday night, uh, which talked about how we can do this on top of Databricks Cloud using GPUs today. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, this is, you know, this is a big capability. So the fact that uh, Google open source TensorFlow is, is huge, mm -hmm. and the fact that now we can run TensorFlow on Spark is, is massive. So people can now start playing around with TensorFlow libraries and see whether it fits for, fits the machine learning problem that they are interested in, right? Uh, not everybody can leverage TensorFlow, but, uh, or uh, deep learning for the matter, mm -hmm. but in cases where you can, now you can seamlessly add it as a library on top mm -hmm. of all the other processing that you do, and you can test it out and see whether this works for you or not. Right. Right. Well, just one more example, really, of this, this fantastic world that's opening up. Exactly. Uh, Ram, thanks for painting the picture. Oh, thanks we a lot. We appreciate that, thank you for being here, and uh, good luck with the rest of your show. Oh, thanks for having me here. Thank all right, you. Ram, you bet. Back with more from theCUBE, or uh, on theCUBE here, looking at uh, what's happening at Spark Summit 2016 here in San Francisco right after this.